this tight. Yeah. <laughs> Try that again. Good morning. Welcome to worship. And welcome to worship on Palm Sunday. What a beautiful, beautiful morning to celebrate uh, the beginning of Holy Week with Palm Sunday. We have a very special worship service as well. So we're glad that you have joined us, whether via uh, uh, on, uh, online or whether it's here in person. We're glad that you have uh, joined us this morning to worship our great God. I do have a couple of announcements that I'd like to share with you this morning. The first is yesterday. If you were on campus yesterday, you know uh, all the exciting things that happened yesterday morning with Bunny Business. 
Um, it was a campus filled with um, all kinds of, a uh, um, lot of children and number of families, a lot of uh, new people to our campus as well. And I understand from talking with Tina that we had over 600 people here yesterday morning. So for those of you that helped or participated, yeah, I know, that's, that's awesome. It was an awesome morning. So if you participated in that or, or attended, um, just thank you for being a part of a very, very special morning. Um, as you know, this is the beginning of Holy Week, um, and with it, we have a number of opportunities to attend very, very special worship services. Our Monday, Thursday worship service will be held on Thursday, April 14th at 6.30, right here in the sanctuary. Uh, our Good Friday worship service will also be here in the sanctuary. It'll be on the 15th at noon, and our Easter Sunday morning worship services, they'll be there will be one at 7 a.m. For those of you who are early risers, that will be um, in the Memorial Garden. It'll be a really special morning as well. And then we'll have another right here at 9 o'clock and then another one at 10.30. So I um, encourage you to come. And the other thing that I encourage you to do is you, if you know of somebody that um, is still kind of looking uh, for a church to attend on Easter Morning. I encourage you to reach out to them and invite them to come with you as well. Well, later this month, we have uh, two very exciting education opportunities. Um, the first is entitled Families and Forgiveness. And uh, the two instructors will be Sharon Hargrave and Dr. Terry Hargrave from Fuller Theological Seminary. And the second class is entitled Christ, Culture, and You with Dr. Phil Eaton, uh, President Emeritus of Seattle Pacific University. These two classes, I think, are going to be excellent. I encourage you to mark your calendar and be a part of it. Both, both courses will be held every Wednesday, April 20th through May 11th from 6 to 7 p.m. So I encourage you to come and be a part of one of those classes. In two weeks, uh, that is Sunday, April 24th, we're, we're going to be having one worship service. It'll be here in the sanctuary at 9.30 in the morning. Our guest preacher uh, will be Dr. Bruce Main. Um, if you have had an opportunity uh, to hear him in the past, you know what a great opportunity it is for us to be with him um, that Sunday morning. So I encourage you to, to be a part of that as well. And he's bringing uh, several of his colleagues in ministry as well. Um, who will be with him. So I think it's going to be a really, really special worship service. It will be Sunday, April 24th, 9.30, right here in the sanctuary. Our next Open Door event will be held on Friday, April 29th, at the home of Bill and Kay Keck from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And um, this is, this, these Open Door events, this is a great opportunity uh, for you to gather with some of your friends, but also uh, meet some new folks as well. And they've been really very well received. Uh, I encourage you, though, to register online for this uh, next Open Door event because space is limited. Um, and again, it's a great way to meet folks. If you're interested in taking that next step in um, learning more about Valley Presbyterian Church and a deeper relationship with us, um, we encourage you to go out to the, uh, after our worship service, go out to the Belong banner. It's by the Welcome Center. Uh, uh, and I encourage you to, uh, to talk with one of our um, elders there. They'd love to pray with you and talk with you and, and um, answer any questions you might have about the life and ministry of our church. Oh, that's a lot of announcements, isn't it? <laughs> David, did you want to come forward and share something really, really exciting that's happening in the life of our church? We also have some pictures today of some new members who are joining, if we could go to those uh, slides. And all of you get extra credit if you can find these people in this wonderful crowd uh, before uh, or after the services and greet them and encourage them, hear a little bit about their story of faith, why they decided to come here, what God is doing in their life, and just bless them and pray for them as they enter our uh, wonderful community. And the, the couple in the middle are going to have that baby baptized at the next service, so... Lots of exciting cake. things. We got cake after service? And we have cake after the service for the, in, in honor of our new members. Good. Thank you. Thank you, David. 
um, I encourage you to, to find one of these new members and welcome them into the life of our church. And now our children are going to be leading us at this time in our Palm Sunday processional. Dear Lord Jesus, on the first Palm Sunday, you entered the city where you were to die. Today, we join your disciples to bless you coming, spreading garments and branches on your way. Enter our hearts, Lord, this morning. Make us ready to lay all we have and all we are at your feet, dedicated to your service. Amen. In Jerusalem today, there is singing in the air. It's a very festive day. Lots of people everywhere. Streets are filled from end to end. Much joy, happiness, and fun. For the Lord came to attention and bring hope to everyone. Praise Hosanna. Praise Hosanna. The good news is spreading fast. Everybody wants to see. Jesus came to them at last, all the way from Galilee. Do you know what he rode? On a donkey of all things. Praise from all the people flow. He was treated like a king. Praise Hosanna. Praise Hosanna. <laughs> long ago to the nation that he chose a new king that they would know now he's there so very close praise hosanna people shout praise hosanna son of david save us please
Well, wasn't that great with our children? Let's give them another hand. Good job, you guys. So at this time, uh, we want to invite all of our children uh, to go ahead and move off to Sunday school. And as our children move off to Sunday school, I invite you to stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. You know, our prayer of confession, our prayer of confession this morning is not only a time to reflect on what we already know about the things in our life that need to be changed, but I think it's also a time where we can be honest before God, seeking God's presence and seeking God's power to mend those things that we want to change. So I want you to take just a moment. This is our prayer of confession. I want you to take a moment and and just read through it. And then after a moment, I'm going to lead us in sharing this prayer together. So take a moment with this prayer of confession. I invite you to join with me in praying this prayer of confession. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of grace and goodness on your people today. Deliver us from cold hearts and wandering thoughts. Free us from narrow self-concern and soul-shrinking obsession. Grant us clear minds to know you, large hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. We ask in the name of Jesus, rightful Lord and glorious King. Amen. You know, at David's plea to God for forgiveness, he asks that God would turn away from his sins, that God would blot out the wrongdoings and would create in him a clean heart and an obedient spirit. For it's a contrite heart that God loves. When we seek God with a repentant heart, we will find God's merciful forgiveness. Rejoice, for in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
I'm in prayer together. Lord God, we thank you for this moment and this space. We pray that you would continue to set it apart and make it holy for your purposes. Lord God, that all that we do and the way that we interact with each other, the way we sing our praises to you, the way that we treat your holy word, may it all bring honor and glory to you, Lord God, for you alone are worthy of our worship. Lord God, we're thankful for this wonderful day, this Palm Sunday. Blessed is the one who comes in your name the one who came in great faithfulness and joy as the people were lining the streets, shouting Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord God, we're thankful that you came not just into Jerusalem, but into our very hearts and our very lives as well. And because of that, Lord God, we pray that in all that we do, in the way that we interact with our family and friends, the way that we interact with our colleagues and classmates and in our neighborhoods and across this world, we pray that we can be a people that shout Hosanna to you, for you alone are worthy in our worship. So we pray that your spirit would continue to work on our hearts, that you would go before us and that you would show us your most excellent way, Lord God. And we're thankful for this holy week, Lord God, and the mighty work that you did on the cross this week, Lord God, where you showed how great your love is for us, that you went down into the depths for us, into suffering and sin and shame, into darkness and despair and death. But Lord God, the grave could not contain you. And with a holy victory, you have redeemed and restored this world. And so we pray that you would continue to do that in our lives and across this nation and the world. Lord God, that wherever people are feeling abused, abandoned, marginalized, Lord God, that you would bring your spirit of truth. Lord God, where people are suffering or mourning, Lord God, we would pray that you would bring your spirit of comfort so that people would know how good you are, Lord God. God, we're thankful for the mighty ways in which you love us and this world, Lord God. We thank you for your continued redemption across this great world, Lord God. And we pray that we could be a people that could continue to shout Hosanna to your name. And so here now, in the stillness and the quietness of this moment, we pray that you would do that first in our hearts. So would you continue to search us as we pray for the things that you have placed on our hearts. Lord God, thank you for the mighty work you've done in our life. We do not take it for granted, but we want to live lives forever changed by your goodness. We pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, as we kick off this holy week, we are going to be housing a couple of families from Family Promise, where we'll be putting them up for the night. We'll be feeding them, making sure uh, that they have a safe place to stay. And this only happens, ministries like this, when you respond to God's call in your life to step outside uh, of your comfort zone, to give of your time and of your talent and of your treasure. And so I just want to say thank you, church, for being a generous church, for responding to that call uh, that God has placed in your lives. Know that whether you give in the back or if you do so online, that lives are truly being transformed in the name of Jesus. So with that generous spirit in mind, let's continue in worship this morning with our offering. Came a dream somewhere. I stood in. 
Lord God, thank you for all that you have done in our lives, and it is our heart's response to give our all back to you. So would you take this offering here laid before you this morning? Would you bless it and use it to glorify and magnify your name here and now across the land so that all people in all places would know the name of Jesus as Lord. Amen. Won't you? Well, dear friends, we have heard the story of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem told by our children today very beautifully. Let's give them a retrospective round of applause. They did a great job with that. Wonderful music. Now we're going to listen uh, to John's version of the entrance. It's, it happens in chapter 12 of his wonderful gospel. 
beginning with verse 12. Let's turn our attention to the scripture. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the Passover festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and so they took branches of palm trees. Can you wave your palm tree branch for me? And they went out to meet him, and they were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey. He sat on it, as it is written in Zechariah 9.9. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming to you, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered the things that had been written of him and done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was because they heard that he'd performed this sign that the multitudes went out to meet him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help these songs and these scriptures to enter into our hearts and then to take shape in our lives as we learn uh, in a deeper way the meaning of your entrance into the great city. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, how many of you have a horror of making unintended mistakes? Anyone dread that? And in particular, when we're writing something, because these days when you write something, you know, it kind of lives forever. And this is a common fear that pastors have had. Before I ever had a communications department, I was a solo pastor, kind of responsible for every publication pretty directly, and no one was really proofreading. And I always had a horror that I would end up in that uh, list online of the most famous church bulletin bloopers. You know the list that I'm talking about? I have a few favorites. Ladies, the rummage sale opportunity is coming. Get rid of all the things you don't want in your house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> the congregation should remain seated until the end of the recession. That could be a long time. Just two letters wrong there. Weight Watchers meets at 7 p.m. Please use the large double doors at the side. <laughs> you can't be saying that in public, right? The Low Self-Esteem Support Group is on Thursday at 7. Please use the back doors. <laughs> it just, it's just awful, isn't it? My favorites, the Potluck Supper Sunday is at 5 p.m. Prayer and medication will follow. <laughs> and perhaps very embarrassing for all the actors in our midst, the church thespians are going to put on a performance of Hamlet Friday night. All are invited to this tragedy. <laughs> now, some of you, when you looked at my title today, thought I had probably entered into that company with a, with a, a spelling mistake and a, a blooper right here on this big, important day, but it's not true. I actually put that in uh, deliberately because I'm going to the Suns game tonight. There's my hat. Any Suns fans out there? And we are going to try to draw a little analogy between events that the Suns have and Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. I was thinking, what is the best analog for a moment? Like the one where Jesus entered Jerusalem. Think of it the intensity, the way in which people's identity was caught up in the great religious festivals, in this case, Passover, a festival of liberation from Egyptian hegemony long ago and release into freedom. And folks would gather, and in fact, probably a million people were in Jerusalem uh, when Jesus entered the city that time. And, and they would celebrate their sense of loyalty and identity together. And I think a similar thing happens at at sporting events, you know, at Suns game, there's a sense of local identity and there's a great gathering that, that ends up in a huge celebration. Uh, are there any Suns fans in the house today? Can you, can you wave your hand? Any Suns fans that are here today? Uh, so we are re renaming this day just for today, just for this year, Palm Suns Day. And we're gonna look at th this comparison. So special locations in both cases. I wanna show you a picture of where the Suns game will be taking place tonight. Anyone know the name of this arena? It's a bit of a trick question. Footprint, very good. You know, it's gone through four name changes, so it's a little tricky. Sponsorship will change. Here's the inside. We get a look, there are 18,422 seats in that arena. About a million square feet. 
It cost $89 million originally and then $86 million to restore and enhance it. Uh, it's interesting, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he didn't have a stadium. There were no tickets uh, purchased on that day. I'll show you a picture of the route that he took. He went from the top of this hill down, down past what are now a series of graves uh, and down into the holy city, about 2,600 feet of descent. And we don't know how many people were there, but if there were a million pilgrims in the city, and you, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, the expectation was it was probably half. There might have been 500,000 people. Not like tonight's 18,422, maybe like the day when the Suns win the championship and we have a big civic parade, right? Can I have an amen, Suns fans? Amen, amen. amen. So uh, that was the location of this event. But in addition, I want to look at the ovations and the expectations. And I'm going to test your coordination a little bit here. I know my wife can do this. She's a music teacher. Uh, but I, I'm not sure about some of you. I want to see if you can stomp. They do this at the Suns game. Can you stomp? You have to be pretty firm because we're on carpet here if you're going to, be, if you're going to impress me. All right, while you're stomping, clap. Now, while you're clapping, pretend that Devin Booker has just made a three-pointer, and you're going to shout, MVP, MVP. MVP. Oh, MVP. all right, very good, very good, very good. You know, it's amazing the way the ovations express the expectations. Uh, Devin Booker's been on the Olympic team. He's won a gold medal, and his, uh, his jerseys are the sixth best-selling in the league. High expectations for him and for the rest of the team. They got to the finals last year. Best record in history this year. And so the ovations really express the expectations that they're going to win the championship this year. This is the thought that's in everyone's hearts. What about the ovations and the expectations for Jesus? Wave those palms again for me. That is, it feels like we're waving a vegetable a little bit, right? But actually you're waving a flag because about 50 or 60 years before Jesus was born, uh, there was a period called the period of the Maccabees. And for 100 years prior to that, they actually, with great cost and a lot of blood, managed to create a period, five generations of freedom from the Romans within what had been a long, tough period. I mean, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, now the Romans, this little nation kind of held in captivity by these bigger nations. But for 100 years... They were relatively free, and the symbol of that was the palm tree. And so in the coins of that period, I think we have a coin, you can see there's a palm tree. They minted their own coins as another sign of our, we're independent, we're sovereign, we're not going to have the head of some Roman person on our coins, we're going to have the symbol of Jewish nationalism. When Jesus entered the city, people were waving the flag. They were saying, the hopes and the dreams of all the years are about to happen. The promises of the prophets, generations under, under servitude and slavery were going to come to an end. And they, they shouted out the words of Psalm 118, blessed is the one, Hosanna, who's going to save us, who's coming in the name of the Lord. I think the expectations were just a little higher and the pressure just a little greater for our Lord as he entered the city. So we have locations and ovations and expectations. How about Preparations. You know, the Suns have 950 employees. It's quite an organization, and they have all kinds of people who work for them, security people and maintenance people and cleaning people, hospitality people, sales people, marketing people. They have coaches and trainers and psychologists and analytics experts. Oh, and by the way, players. <laughs> I mean, it takes a lot of people to put on one game. I mean, it's a huge, amazing effort. The big moments actually depend on a lot of smaller moments prior to the game. And I was reminded of that recently by their great coach, who's also a Christian, Monty Williams. Let's see if we got a picture of Monty, I think. There he is at the All-Star Game. Monty uh, decided to break with tradition. At, at the end of a really big victory, and not so many days ago, uh, the Suns beat the Lakers, <laughs> eliminating them from the playoffs. And on that game, the game ball was given not to one of their all-stars or one of their Hall of Famers or one of the players who played particularly great that day. It was given to this man 
let's see if we have his picture, Jay Gaspar, who has never scored a point in the NBA. He's the equipment manager. It's his job to make sure the basketballs are inflated, inflated just the right way and the uniforms are ready to go. Interesting, isn't it? But Jay Gaspar and Monty Williams' gesture illustrates that the big moments depend on the small moments, don't they? It was the same way with Jesus. Someone had to fetch the donkey or there wasn't a ride. Someone had to lend the donkey or there wasn't a ride. Way back when on his first birthday, the innkeeper had to give a little room at the back of his property or, or the birth might not have happened. Unknown families gave hospitality throughout his ministry so that the miracles and the teaching could happen with this itinerant band that depended on others for a place to stay. Once a little boy gave his lunch and so 5,000 people were fed, the big moment depended on the small moment. And this makes life exciting. Have you ever thought about it? Because small things done with great care, with great attention, with great love can have unexpected results. There was once a Scottish farmer who was mending his fence at the edge of his field his small plot, and he heard a cry from across the road. He jumped over his fence, he went, and there was a bog, and there was a little boy drowning in this bog. And so he pulled him out, it took about a minute, didn't think anything more of it, and the next day there was a knock, knock, knock on his door, and it was a nobleman. It turned out the farmer had saved the nobleman's son from drowning in this bog. And so he was very grateful, and he said, can I give you a reward? And the farmer said, no, no, it was a small thing. Your thanks are enough. But the nobleman noticed in the corner there was a, a, another boy, the farmer's son, and he said, are you, are you educating your son? And, and the farmer said, no, the crops have not been good. I don't have enough resources, and so I'm not able to do that. The nobleman said, I'd like to educate your son. Would you let me? It's just a small thing. But if your son is anything like you, he might be a great man someday. And so the farmer agreed, and the boy, whose name was Alex, Alexander, was educated at school in London. Eventually, he graduated from medical school in London. His name is Dr. Alexander Fleming. He's the man who discovered penicillin. And so from a small thing came a thing that turned out to be very important, but the story goes on because the nobleman's son, now grown up, got a very bad case of pneumonia and was about to die until the penicillin was administered. And that saved his life. He was saved twice, the same family. And that's important for all of us because the nobleman was Lord Randolph Churchill and his son was Winston Churchill who had a decisive role in the preservation of our civilization. You know, it makes life exciting to think. That teenager that you mentor may right wrongs or, or discover truths. That child that you're teaching in Sunday school, she may do deeds that glorify God or she may sing in a way that inspires others. That senior that you're visiting and praying with and for you may be sustaining their faith as the shadows lengthen and the evening finally comes. Locations and ovations and expectations and preparations. We've got one more, right? Motivations. What motivates the sons for all those efforts, all those 950 people? Well, last year they had revenues of $321 million. I contributed a little bit. This was $35 and... <laughs> This was $26 just for, just for one game. Uh, there's all kinds of resources that pour into the league from TV and from sponsors and, and uh, merchandising. The aim is not only to be victorious in business, though, it's to win on the court, isn't it? To win a championship, to get that banner up in the rafters and a ring on your finger. The custom in baseball is that on the first day of the new season, which was this week, the last year's uh, World Series champions, and that would be, see, it's, it's hard to remember, isn't it, right? <laughs> the Atlanta Braves, they had rings put on their fingers this week that had 522 diamonds in each ring. Quite amazing. So there is a motivation, isn't there, to go down in the storied history of a franchise? The motivation is validation that comes with victory, success, and significance somehow in the sweeping movement of time where we move on from game to game and year to year and sport to sport and series to series and we quickly forget the last set of heroes to make a mark strong enough that for a moment, a brief shining moment, you are at least known and remembered. It was interesting. I looked around to see if there were shirts 
of any of the previous heroes of this great franchise, the Suns. And there was only one shirt from a previous player, Steve Nash. It was as if none of the other players ever existed, including my two favorites, Stick and Tom Van Arsdale. Yeah. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? The motivation was validation. What was Jesus' motivation for entering the holy city long ago? His motivation was salvation. When, he, when he, he was asked by his disciples not to go to Jerusalem on a number of occasions, but he set his face in that way, it's in the middle of every gospel, began to move toward Holy Week. He was asked to come to Bethany, which was very close to the city of Jerusalem, because his, a family he was close to was in distress. Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, had gotten sick. He was gravely ill. He eventually died. The disciples again tried to restrain Jesus. We see this in, the, in this little moment where Jesus decides to go to Bethany to heal Lazarus, to call him back from the dead right at the time of Passover, no doubt exciting the crowd and galvanizing his enemies. And the disciples say, let us go and die with him. At that point, they know it becomes for him inevitable. Jesus decided to be his true self, the Lamb of God, he understood the temptation, do you, of your false self, your almost self, your shadow person that lives in you and lives in me? Pretending to be your shadow self is a little bit exhausting. I know the brand new executive was once in his office on the first day and he was sitting behind his desk and seeing what it was gonna be like to be in this corner office. He had a new assistant that he was gonna be meeting and uh, he was just enjoying this new promotion that he had and there was a knock on the door, it was the new assistant and she came in and he raised his finger like this, he said, just a minute, just a minute and he picked up his, uh, his phone and he began to talk into his phone to some other person, some interlocutor on the other end and, and eventually he came to the end of the call and he, 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 in an authoritative voice, he said, well, thank you very much, sir and, and, and you too and he put down the phone and he said, you know, it was, the, it was the CEO of the company just wishing me luck on my first day and, asking my advice about a few things, and, and uh, why is it that you've, you've come to see me at the moment? She said, well, I'm, I'm your new assistant, and I came to hook up your phone. <laughs> Jesus understood the temptation of the false self, the almost me, the shadow person. Everyone else wanted him to be another person. The crowds wanted him to, to be that great Jewish liberator, that national figure, to give them the validation at last of victory over their enemies. The disciples, too, wanted to find the best places in the new earthly kingdom that he would establish. It reminds me of that moment early in his, before his ministry had begun where the evil one said, I want to show you the kingdoms of this world. I am the Lord of coercion and power and hate, and you can rule over all these kingdoms if you just bow the knee. But Jesus refused. It took, takes great courage to go on the court, doesn't it? <laughs> to assume the responsibility for a, a franchise and its success and the hopes and dreams of a city. You have to have courage to do it, but it took greater courage to disappoint the crowds, to resist the pressure of the disciples, to continue to be the Lamb of God, to let your life be controlled by your scheming opponents and corrupt Roman officials, and in all of that to believe that humiliation and shame were the right route and not victory and fame, to trust in the providence and direction of God. Jesus came to invite us. He came to invite us to let go of our selfish ambition, to lose our lives, the lives centered on our own egos and our own success and our own fame in order to live a life of love for God and others. It's a simple appeal to find a new freedom in service and forgiveness, in mercy and sacrifice. He came to save us from the, the sin of the false self and from the futility that comes with it. You know, when I was in graduate school, Henry Nouwen was the most famous and popular writer on Christian spirituality. He's a Catholic, and it shows you how much times have changed. I can't imagine now a, a Catholic Christian writer on spirituality being popular and, and, and a best-selling author, but he was, right on the New York Times list. So much so that the Ivy League schools began to compete to try to get him onto the faculty. They all offered him various kinds of positions and, and lectureships, and he experimented with this for a while at Princeton, at Harvard, and, and at Yale. 
He had lots of acclaim and lots of attention, but then he did this strange thing. He decided to give up the Ivy League professorships and the best-selling books and to live in a community of developmentally disabled adults, the Larch community. One day, a friend of his in that community, whose name was Trevor, went to the hospital for some treatment, and Henry called the ward that Trevor was on and asked and got permission and registered to come and to have lunch with him on the ward in his room. But word spread. The person that took the call, I guess, passed it along a little bit. She'd heard the name Henry Nowen, and it got to the administration. And the administration sent an emergency email and a request to Henry Nowen. Will you come, not to the ward, but come. We'll have a special lunch for you. Lots of people want to meet you. The administration wants to meet you, and the board wants to meet you, and the doctors and the chaplains, they want to meet you. Will you come to a lunch at the same time in the golden room? And Henry said, well, I guess I will. And he arrived at the Golden Room and he was pretty well surrounded by a crowd of people. They had books for him to sign. Some of them had even read one of the introductions and the back jacket. And some had thought of a deep question they were gonna ask Henry. Imagine the conversation they could have afterwards. And then I asked Henry now in a really tough and searching question. But Henry looked around and he didn't see his friend Trevor. He said to the head of the hospital, where's Trevor? The head of the hospital said, well, I'm sorry, but..." But patients and staff cannot eat together in the golden room. It's never been done. It's one of our sacred rules. And Henry said, well, I'm afraid I can't stay. And they said, well, maybe we'll make an exception. And they fetched Trevor from his room, and Trevor came down not knowing he was the exception. And he was extremely happy to see his friend Henry, who he was seated next to. He was beaming at everyone, and then in the middle of the meal, he stood up, and he said, a toast, a toast, a toast. The room quieted down and he said, if you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. There was a kind of an odd silence. as everyone stared at this young man. But he started to sing again and at the back there was a few who began to join in and then a few more. Then it became a raucous chorus. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. And just for a moment, no one was competing with anyone else and no one was showing off. No one was protecting or promoting their image, advancing their interests, growing their networks. Everyone got a little closer to the true version of themselves. The good news we discover in Holy Week, friends, is that we don't have to find our true selves on our own, our courageous selves because there was someone once who lived the most beautiful and courageous and truest life ever lived, and that someone already knows who we are. He lived for us and loved for us and taught for us and died for us and rose for us so we could be free of our shadow selves, of our egos and our narcissism and our doubts and our fears and our futilities. And he invites those today who wanna give him room in their lives and in their hearts that special salvation of becoming the person they were really meant to be. And that's why, oddly enough, when you think about it, strangely enough, I think probably I may remember for a week or two or a month the game that I attend tonight, this exciting game. I'm looking forward to it. I will cheer hard. But 2,000 years after a 20-minute walk down a hill in Jerusalem, We are still celebrating, along with billions of people, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. It's impossible if it wasn't true. But you see, we celebrate the power of the one who came to make us real, and really ourselves. Blessings for Palm Sunday. Amen.
from this place. May the Lord of life go with you, behind you to protect you, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you the gifts that never end of faith, hope, and love, and always before you to encourage you in all you do and all you are and all God's people said. Thank you.